Welcome. It's great to have you here. I want to welcome you to Campus Bible here at our second service. Those of you who are joining us in person as well as those who are joining online. You know, I'm thankful this morning. I really am. You know, I'm thankful that no matter what we face, no matter what we're going through or our failures or our sin, that we have forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. That is such an amazing thing. And sometimes I feel like I can't quite comprehend it. But he came, he shed his blood, and we have forgiveness through that. And it doesn't just stop there. That our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, works to restore us and renew us, that one day he will bring us to himself. That where he is, we too will be living with him forever and all eternity. What an amazing thing. And it's cause for celebration. It's cause for celebration because he didn't leave us where we were. That he never lost sight of us. He paved a way for redemption even from the foundation of the earth. Let's celebrate that this morning. Let's worship him. Let's praise him. Please stand. Join me in prayer before we dive into singing to our Lord. Father, we thank you for your love for us. And it is an amazing thing that, you know, looking at all creation, who is man that you are so mindful of him? Lord, you, you gave your son. You paved a way for redemption. We thank you so much for that. So we lift our voices this morning in worship and praise to you. Please open our hearts this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
all the power in all the world. You are worthy of it all. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, church family. Welcome to worship. My name is Mark Tremaine. I'm the junior high director here at our Maple campus. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our worship service this morning. We're so glad you're here. Um, we'd like to encourage you to take out one of those connection cards in your seat back pocket if you have a prayer request or something you'd like to share with our staff. Um, we love getting those from you, so if you'd like to take the next few minutes to do that, um, our staff would be more than happy to follow up with you this week. If you are new to campus, welcome. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today. Um, we invite you to stop by the Info Center out on the patio over to the left. Um, we have a special gift we'd like to give you as a welcome to campus. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have about our church, about our programs, um, or anything that we can answer for you. Um, we have several things going on in the life of our church that we'd like to bring to your attention this morning. The first is that there is a special congregational business meeting immediately following the second service at 12.30 p.m. here in this auditorium. Um, our membership is going to be asked to approve granting ministry licenses for Jim Piccini, Justin Blue, and Joel Caraballo. Um, we invite everyone to attend, but we especially encourage all active members in good standing to show up and vote so that we have enough people. Um, the next event to bring to your attention, we are continuing our Sunday Night Live series next Sunday, June 9th, by celebrating our 10-year anniversary of our merger with Palm Avenue Community Church. Uh, yeah, round of applause. June marks 10 years since God merged Campus Bible Church with Palm Avenue, Avenue Community Church, which is now our Palm Campus, to form one church in two locations. Um, on June 9th, here in the auditorium from 6 to 7.30 p.m., we're going to hear the story of God's provision and faithfulness in that entire process. There will be testimonies from former pastors, a combined worship team representing both our Maple and our Palm Campus, and lots of wonderful desserts. If you've never heard the story of how God brought a bunch of Methodists, Presbyterians, and Baptists together and turned them into one Bible church, you will not want to miss this event. Um, it's going to be a night of worship, praises, special memories. We're going to hear from Jim and Karen Cece, Kenton Ron, Tom Summers, Tommy Leon, and many more. We invite all of you guys to come out and celebrate um, just the work that God has done in the life of our church over these past 10 years. Our next announcement is that the Tri-Tip Fundraiser is ending today. If you have not had the opportunity to buy a delicious Tri-Tip meal from one of our high school students as they're raising money to go to either um, Hume Lake Summer Camp or a summer mission trip to La Misión, Mexico, those are available on the patio after services. Um, if you have already purchased a ticket, those are gonna be available for pickup next Sunday, June 9th, after both the first and second service. For more information, contact me. Um, our fourth announcement, the Women's Heart to Heart has their next event coming up tomorrow. That's Monday, June 3rd from 6.30 to 8 p.m. They will be doing an event called the Heart of Worship at the Palm Auditorium. Um, ladies, plan to join us for, well, not us, I'm not gonna be there. Um, a night of worship and fellowship at our Palm campus. There will be light refreshments available in the courtyard afterward. It is a free event, but we encourage signups um, just to know how many people are going to be there. You can sign up online or contact the church office. And finally, men, um, we are starting our summer Bible study this Tuesday, June 4th, and that runs through July 23rd from 7 to 8.30 p.m. in Maple, A201. Um, we are going to be studying the book of Jonah with a book called You Can't Outrun Grace by Paul Tripp. Um, Jonah is a short, bizarre, and powerful tale, rich in biblical theology, showing us that we cannot, in fact, outrun God's grace. There is no cost, so we encourage all men to show up for a great time of discussion, fellowship, and camaraderie with other men, and we do ask that you register online in advance. Um, we have a special offertory presented by our Bells of Celebration Choir. But first, I'm going to pray for the offering, if the men would like to come forward at this time. Father, we thank you for this church, um, for all the lives that are represented here, for everything that you're doing in the work of um, our church, our staff, our congregation, um, just for your hand of provision, even in thinking about the, the 10 years that we've celebrated um, since bringing Palm Avenue Community Church um, as a part of Campus Bible. I ask that you would be with us this morning as we head into our time of worship, that you would be with Pastor Will as he brings the message today. Give us um, ears to hear, that you would give Will the correct words to say. We ask that your blessing would be on this offering. 
um, and just that you would continue to bless our church um, and everyone here. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bells of Celebration, aren't they incredible? Yeah. And then that song, yeah, one of a round of applause. How can I keep from singing your praise? That might be my uh, theme as I preach every uh, Sunday. But uh, at this time, I'd like just to uh, stand. Why don't you uh, take a moment to greet someone that you have not already welcomed them to this morning's service? Maybe ask them, how can you keep 
from singing. So uh, as you were finding your uh, seats, um, I want to remind you that today is also Promotion Sunday. So a lot of our children, youth, uh, high school students have moved up into the next class for the first uh, Sunday of the year. And so uh, if you have somebody who uh, did that or know someone who might have done that this morning, it would be cool to ask them how their first day in their new class was today. But this is also uh, the first day for me officially in this new position as the uh, Campus Bible Church Student Ministries Pastor, and um, I am just, <laughs> I am uh, yeah, overwhelmingly honored by um, it, people's uh, confidence and trust in me, I guess. Um, yeah, the least of these the Lord would use. Um, I am also excited, though, but as a sports guy, as a United States Marine Corps veteran, I just value so much the uh, the, the teamwork aspect of things and appreciate so much Paul's illustration of the church being one body with many different members, many different functions. And there are a lot of things um, that I am not good at. Yeah? So I love preaching, I love teaching, I love students, but uh, there's a, a ton that I don't do well. So a little shameless plug there for any of you who love students and things like that, if you're interested and in, in not uh, involved in the work of uh, the, the Lord here at this church there's uh, room for you, yeah. So uh, just getting into um, this morning's text, though, the, the phrase, for goodness sake, has been used regularly to express one's feelings of frustration and impatience. It first appeared in written English in the prologue to uh, Shakespeare's Jacobean play, Henry VIII, and my recollection of the term goes all the way back to my childhood, when my grandmother used the term to express her frustration with me, saying things like, boy, if you don't go close that door... For goodness sake. <laughs> or boy, if you don't go take a shower, you smell like outside. <laughs> For goodness sake. It's like, what does that phrase really mean, Grandma? Like, for goodness sake, yeah? It wasn't until recently that I urged a pause to try to understand the phrase, and we know it usually is used in anger or agitation, but in its simplest of terms, the phrase just means for the sake of everything good, pure, honest, decent, etc. And, and the phrase was originally a, a simple call to invoke action or change for the sake of good. And yet the Bible tells us that none are good. Right? Psalm 14, 1, they are corrupt, they do abominable deeds, none does good. They have all turned aside together, they have all become corrupt, there is no one who does good, not even one. There is no true good for goodness sake. Why? Because the heart of man is corrupt. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, Paul tells us in Romans 3.23. And even the, the good that we do apart from God is filthy rags because it's marred, corrupted, tainted by our sin. So it would appear that there's no such thing as good for the sake of good. Action for the sake of good or for goodness sake is a futile venture, so to speak. And yet, as we jump into this morning's passage, we see a similar call to action. But we're not talking about action for goodness sake, but rather we're, we're studying what I'm calling removing obstacles for the gospel's sake. And so I'd like to welcome you back to our study of the Gospel of Matthew. We're expositionally walking through this book of the Bible, chapters and uh, verses at a time, comma by comma, line by line. This portion of uh, Matthew that we're studying is called The Authority of the King. And this morning we are picking up where we left off last week in Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 through 27. So if you have your Bibles, uh, you can open them to Matthew 17, 22 through 27, and uh, the verses are also in those outlines that we provided for you as well. So uh, the Bible says, Matthew 17, 22 through 27, and while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. 
And they were deeply grieved. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachmae tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the two drachmae tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? When Peter said, From strangers, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. So while I was in my study, I found myself asking the question, why is this story here? One of the reasons is Matthew's gospel is, in fact, the only of the gospel narratives to mention this story specifically. Now, I figured, you know, maybe it's because he's a tax collector and the story has to do with money, right? So it's right up Matthew's alley. But the, the thing that we all must remember each time that we open the text and dive into it a little bit more is, that Ma- is what Matthew's purpose is for writing this gospel. And that was to tell his audience about who Jesus was. And as always, this passage does that and so much more for us this morning. So let's dive in. You ready to study with me this morning? Yeah? All right, let's keep our Bibles open. So first thing we're going to be taking a look at is the king's second passion prediction for the gospel's sake. And we see this idea of being delivered for the gospel's sake at verse 22. The Bible says again, While they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of of men. And we call this uh, the, the second passion prediction because this is the second time that Jesus foretold what was going to happen to him. The first was a couple of weeks ago in, um, in uh, verse 12 of chapter 17. And there's some individuals who kind of go back and forth about this being the second passion uh, prediction. So there's this tiny distinction that's got to be made before we kind of move forward. Um, but there are two verses essentially that we're talking about in Matthew uh, as it relates to what we're talking about this morning. One is Matthew 16, 21, where Matthew talks about, um, he mentions that from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and things like that uh, at the hands of the elders and the chief priest, and he will be raised on the third day. But in chapter, uh, in verse 12, I'm sorry, Jesus himself makes the passion prediction as he does here this morning. And so the reason we call this the second of the two is because one of them does not have Jesus himself saying those terms. The other does, right? Semantics, but I think it's worth clarifying. So anyway, uh, with this second passion prediction, we're kind of continuing where we left off last week. Remember, uh, verse 19 mentions that Jesus is with his uh, disciples. And so as he addresses them this morning, he starts with this interesting pun saying, the son of man will be delivered into the hands of men. And using that term son of man that Jesus often uses uh, to describe himself. Uh, One of my, a friend of my library noted that the one who comes to men and lives for them will be taken by them and eliminated from them. And in in the general sense, man, the term man, when we see it in the Bible, is is often used uh, in opposition to God. Man is an enemy of the Lord. Mentioned that uh, already in how corrupt our deeds are, Psalm 14 mentions. And Jesus even more clearly calls man's sinners in his third prediction, saying the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners in 2645. And yet, even in man's enmity with God, he is still at work. God can and does turn man's wrath into worship for himself. Turns man's wrath into his his worship. Turns man's hatred for his holy plan. Even Isaiah 53.10, he says, the Bible says, yet the will of the Lord was to crush him. Right? So how do we make that plain? Well, we, we can just simply ask the question here, how does the Son of Man get into the hands of men? Was he taken? Was he pilfered? Was he appropriated? I don't know. Jesus said himself, John 18, or 10, 18, no one takes my life from me. What does he say? I lay it down. And, and, and guess what? Since I lay it down, I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. No, no, no. They didn't swipe Jesus' life from him. This little sort of, you know, gotcha moment, right? Jesus himself said that what was going to happen to him? He was going to be 
delivered. Paradidomi in the Greek is the word. It essentially talks about being handed over or offered up. And that's much different if we look at it from that perspective. Jesus being offered up um, into the hands of his enemies in the same way that Israel was offered up into her enemies. And uh, all throughout the book of Judges, we see that, but specifically in Judges uh, 2, 14, the Bible says, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. This was ultimate judgment for Israel. And in the same way, Jesus was handed over because there needed to be judgment. There needed to be some sort of atonement. Some, there, there were payments that were due, accounts that needed to be reconciled, and Jesus was handed over to men and was ultimately judged with the judgment that men deserved. Right? Here it is. He was delivered into the hands of men so that men could be delivered. Upon him was the the chastisement that brought us peace. By his stripes, we are healed. Family, Jesus was delivered for the gospel's sake. And again, to be crystal clear on this, Jesus wasn't taken, wasn't stolen, wasn't duped, wasn't tricked. Beloved, Jesus Christ, when he became incarnate, he chose to give up. I say he chose to give up good so we could get to great. He chose to give up so we could go up. And he didn't just give up his life, though. He gave up something else. You say, Pastor, well, what, what else did he give up? Well, when, when I was thinking about this, I was reminded of that, that wonderful hymn that we sing during Christmas time, written by Charles Wesley, right? The hymn says, Mild he lay his glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to give us second birth. Or born to raise. I messed that up. (laughs) Born to raise the sons of earth. Appreciate you. Born to give us second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Y'all know the words. Come on now. Now, but the mild he lay his glory by is what we're talking about. He set aside something in order to come to earth. The eternal son of God. The second person in the Trinity, Emmanuel, God with us, didn't just lay aside his life for us. He laid aside his glory that came with his deity. Yeah, he he gave up the splendor, the grandeur, the the brilliance, the magnificence, the, the right to be highly exalted when he chose humiliation, when he chose degradation, when he chose suffering, when he chose to be flogged and spit on and beat and mocked and whipped, when he chose crucifixion, when our Savior chose... To be delivered, he humbled himself, laying his glory aside. As we'll even see later, he he even submitted to the temple tax, which was an insult to his glory. Willingly laid down, set aside for man, for us, for the world. And not only was he delivered for the gospel's sake, but of course, this means that he chose death for the gospel's sake. Verse 23, continuing it, the Bible says that, he, or that they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. The, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is at the foundation of of the gospel message. It's at the core of the good news. And, and what Jesus does via the resurrection is he takes the sting out of death. And of course, this isn't just good news for us today. It should have been good news for those who were in the audience, who those who this Jesus was specifically addressing and speaking to. But the verse ends by saying what? They were deeply grieved. They felt sorrow. They, they were uncomfortable. 
They had an issue. They had challenges. With this. They have a hard time understanding. They, they, they could not see how the end of his life was not the end of the situation. That, 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 that Jesus here is saying that, that he is going to die, that's kind of where they stop. And Jesus is able to see, though, and, and notice what he says. He doesn't just say that he will rise on the third day. He says that he will be raised on the third day. Again, maybe semantics here, but I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. Our king's confidence comes from the fact that he trusted in the father's promises. Right? The, 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 either the disciples were, were not listening, which wouldn't be a surprise. You know, they kind of hear what they want to hear. They've done that before. Go back and listen to the last sermon that I preached. Or they simply don't have the right perspective. They don't see any good news that can come out of this. What about this is good? I imagine them asking themselves. They have this nearsighted perspective and they can't imagine anything coming out of news that their master, that their teacher, that their Lord was going to be killed, crucified for their behalf. Here it is. They are so deeply distressed at the prospect of the Messiah's suffering that they're deaf, they're blinded to the promise of his resurrection. Overfocused on the prospect of death, miss the promise of resurrection. You say, Pastor Will, that might be a little too far, but there's some Bible for my argument, right? Jesus, in, in his, after his resurrection, as he appears to the disciples, the Bible says in Matthew 28, 17, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Some still had a hard time. Some still couldn't understand. Even after three passion predictions and, and, and exactly what the master said was going to happen happens, some still didn't believe. Why? Well, in the, I believe that the problem was that even in the moment that they were experiencing, their pain was getting in the way of seeing the promise. The circumstances that they were going through was, was, was blinding their vision, so to speak. They had a hard time seeing past what they were currently going through. You see, they are confident in the words about death, but they are not as confident in the words about resurrection. And can I give you a word that the Lord gave to me in my study? Again, this might just be for Pastor Will. So if it is, just you can have some... Uh, 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 eavesdropping on our conversation. Yeah, but, the, but this is what the Lord told me. That they, they're confident in the words about death, Will, because that's what they've seen. They've seen death. They're not as confident in the promise of the resurrection, which they have never seen. I'm sure they've seen people get handed over. They've seen people get killed. Do you know what they've never seen? Somebody get back up. And so again, the, the, the point for me was, well, it's so easy for you to see the pain of your problem, the challenge of your situation, the difficulty of your circumstances. Why? Because you've seen those types of things before. But what you haven't seen is how my promises work in the midst of your pain. What you haven't seen is exactly how my promises can come true in the midst of your circumstance, despite your situation, despite your difficulty. And that is exactly what faith is, right? the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Our assurance, our confidence comes from the understanding and the evidence that gets presented to us. So that's where the disciples' confidence should come from. It should come from the evidence that gets presented to them. Where's the evidence? Jesus himself saying, I will be raised. I will be raised is all the evidence that they should need. And for us, it is that, that our the promises that his plan is better than our plan for our lives. The, the promises that he'll never leave nor forsake. The promises that if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more does he love you? How much more will he clothe you? How much more will he provide for you? The promises that says, that says, says though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me, because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Lord, let, may your promises be where I get my confidence from. And, and we look at the text sometimes, and I say it before, but like hindsight is always twenty twenty. We look at the disciples and say, you silly disciples. He literally just promised he was going to be raised. Why are you tripping? What's wrong with you? How could you have missed it? 
Forgetting that we've all been there. Forgetting that, that we've all been so discouraged by the bad news that it's hard to believe in, to rejoice for, to even see the good things happening around us. So deeply grieved that it's easy to miss the beautiful promise of God, the peace of God, which quite frankly doesn't make sense in the midst of what we're currently going through. That peace that is promised to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The, the good news never changes. The promises of God never change, despite what's happening around us, despite what circumstances might look like, despite what situations we find ourselves in. And my prayer for us this morning is that discouragement would never blind us to the good news that is happening around us, to the promises of God for us and his faithfulness to us. Amen? Can I preach this morning? I just want to... Is that all right? Yeah. We get to, the, it's, it's interesting, this passage kind of has these two uh, sections almost. And so we come to this second section, beginning at verse 24, with the king's priorities being questioned. So again, the Bible says in 24, when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachmae tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the two drachmae tax? So the disciples go from Galilee to Capernaum. There's a little modern day of uh, an aerial view of Capernaum there on the screen. Uh, uh, but th they get there, and when they get there, those who collect the tax, again, instead of going to Jesus, they go to Simon, Peter. And they say, hey, what's up with your, your teacher? And again, I'm not entirely sure why they don't go directly to Jesus, but that's what happens in the story. They come to him and say, hey, you know your teacher's like guilty of felony tax evasion, right? Like he's, he's dodging, ducking. Is he, what, what is he doing here? And a couple things happening in the, the text. For, for starters, the, the tax itself was a legitimate tax. The two drachmae tax, what scholars call the temple tax, was derived from it originated uh, back in Exodus 30 for the maintenance of the temple. And so every Jewish adult would uh, pay off a half a shekel, uh, that is two drachmae, to keep uh, the upkeep of the, the tabernacle in the wilderness, so to speak, which essentially became an annual tax that was used for the upkeep and the functions of the temple in Jesus' day. But the, the interesting thing that I was thinking about in my mind it, it was the, the relationship between Jesus and the temple, right? So if you remember uh, several months ago, in, earlier in this gospel account, I preached a message on Matthew 12, where Jesus himself says, I say to you, something greater than the temple is here. And again, if you were here that morning, I said, Jesus is basically saying to them in the audience, I'm him. I'm that guy. The champ is here. The, the one that this thing points to is standing in front of you, right? And so I'm thinking in my mind, if, if I was Peter, especially after the transfiguration experience that he just went through, I'd be like, um, yeah, you know, uh, you, do you know who my teacher is? Like, uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to be paying that uh, tax today, right? Luckily, I'm not Peter, right? So uh, in my mind, Peter's response is still interesting, though. Take a look at the king's rebuttal in verses 25 and 26. He starts by saying, yes, he is going to pay the tax. And that was his response, simple yes. It indicated that Peter likely had seen Jesus pay this tax in the past, and there'd be no issues now. But the Bible continues and says, and when they came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, what do you think, Simon? From who do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? When Peter said from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. So a couple things going on here. Peter uh, heads to the house that they're likely all staying in. And, and it seems like Peter wants to talk to Jesus about the exchange that just took place because Matthew mentions that Jesus got to him first. And then Jesus applies one of his most often used methods of teaching. He asks a question. And Jesus was the goat of asking questions. That is, greatest of all time, not bad goat, right? Um, I imagine if Jesus was around today, he'd be like a, a top podcaster, right? Uh, inviting guests on his show or late night talk show host or something, just asking, plaguing questions, but teaching while asking questions. And he asks a simple question. He says, do you think that those who are in authority, when they collect taxes, 
the very resources necessary to fund their reign and their programs, their venture. Do you think that that comes from their children? That that comes from their family members? That that comes from loved ones? Or does it come from strangers? Peter rightfully responds, from strangers. So then, Jesus says, correct the mundo. Pete, you got it. You hit the nail on the head. So guess what? In that case, the sons are exempt. The sons are exempt. The children are free. Earthly kings don't tax their children. That'd be crazy, right? Yeah, of course it would. So, so who do they tax? They tax their subjects. I was thinking about it like this. Like, some of you know uh, I, Pastor Will, am also Coach Staley, right? And it'd be like uh, my uh, daughter, Lily Ella Joy, one day coming to me and be like, hey, Dad, you know what? Can I have some private volleyball lessons? I'd be like, yes, finally. All right, yeah, we can do that. That's going to run you about $1,300, though. Just <laughs> want you to be clear. We could set up a payment plan or something like that, but, you know. Or even I was thinking, I was thinking uh, last night on my way home, my wife called me and Lily wanted to talk to me. All my family, all my kids are all sick, so you know, pray for this daily family. Uh, Lily's calling me. She's like a little upset. And it, Alexis is like, uh, Lily, tell Dad what you told me. She said, I want Dad to hold me. And I was thinking like, you know I charge by the minute though, right? So <laughs> every 60 seconds, that might be a couple... <laughs> No, of course not. That'd be crazy. For, for the daughter of the one who is in authority, it is free. There's no tax. There's nothing associated with it. So what are we talking about? Well, in this case, Jesus is saying he, a.k.a. the son of God, the royal son, the one who the temple rightfully points to, in no world would it make sense that he would be bound to paying the same tax that the subjects are bound to paying. Here it is, the king of the temple is God, and Jesus, as the son of God, the son of the king, is rightfully free from paying the temple tax. But what Jesus says is interesting. Now let me repeat it. He said, the sons are exempt. Not son, capital S. The sons are exempt. So what are we talking about? Now, I, I realized after I made the, um, this PowerPoint presentation that tax exempt might have been a little bit of a challenging of a picture. I'm just like, uh... I don't want anybody to walk away thinking the wrong thing, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, don't, 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 don't call the IRS and say, my pastor said, go read Matthew 17, 26. It says the, the children are exempt right here, you know? I just, I don't know what to tell you. No, that's not, that's not how it works, okay? Just want to clarify. And if you do tell them that your pastor sent you, tell them it was Pastor Jim, okay? Um, <laughs> don't put my name in all that. <laughs> Here's the point, so I need to do some damage control, right? <laughs> The, 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 the exemption, the freedom that we experience is the freedom from the bondage that is typically associated with authority or with that which those in authority are uh, uh, putting on to us, the obligations that they put on us, right? Free from the bondage even of selfishly caring about ourselves more than our neighbor, free from the bondage of worrying about tomorrow, again, because tomorrow has enough worries of our own. Beloved, the children are free. And so the question is, do we understand said freedom? Right? The, the application is for us to understand that, that our freedom comes from Christ's propitiation for our sins, our, our adoption into the family of God. As we have become children, we are exempt, is what Jesus is saying. We are free. The veil is torn. The temple is later destroyed in A.D. 70. Uh, we are free as a people, free from the power of sin, free from the death, uh, uh, the power of death, free from the power of influence of the world, free from the fiery darts of the enemy. We are free. Right, I was thinking of that Eddie James song, no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to dance, I'm sorry, I just want to, I want to get going here. Again, how can I help from singing? When I'm in this pulpit, I just, I love giving the Lord what he is due. We are free, though. 
Because of Jesus, our debt has been paid, and as children of God, our reminder, our understanding is our freedom. And what we do with that freedom for his glory is how we're kind of going to close, right? So we, we take a look at the king's humility for the gospel's sake. So Jesus says, however... So we do not offend them. Now, this is interesting to just pause right there. Even with that word forever, he says, the, son, the sons are exempt, however. Meaning that the script is getting ready to get flipped right now. Yeah? However, Jesus interjects, meaning, okay, hold on, hold your seat. Just let me, let me pause for a second. And again, to, to reiterate, because of who Jesus is, He wasn't required to pay the tax. He was exempt. He was free. As children of the Most High, we are free. And yet, what do we do with that freedom? Typically, what we do with that type of freedom is we say, taxes? You know who I am? I'm a son. I ain't got to pay no taxes. What's wrong with you? So we think that Jesus would respond with, he's the king. He doesn't have to pay taxes. Taxes? What are you talking about, taxes? Playoffs? Anyway. Some of you got it. But... What Jesus did while he was on the earth was he did submit to every law of God. So he chose to submit here as well, even though, as I mentioned, even asking him to pay taxes was an insult to his glory. But it's deeper than that. Somebody say it's deeper than that. Because notice the rationale that Jesus uses for paying. He says, however, so that we do not offend them. Right? That word uh, offend is uh, scandalizo in the Greek. It's actually interesting. It's where we get our English word scandal from. But it refers to uh, causing another to sin. So not just simply offense for them being offended for the sake of them, their feelings being hurt. Right? He says so that they uh, aren't caused to sin. But it's even deeper than that. So you have to bear with me as I nerd out a little bit here. But the phrase in essence, it means that not to cause another to sin, driving them from faith. So, so, so what he means here as he's talking about driving them from faith, one author put it this way, he said, in order to guard against unbelief in others, he says that we must be able to forego our own freedoms and privileges. In order to guard against unbelief in others, we must be able to, willing to, forego our own freedoms and privileges. But this shouldn't be news to us. Right? The the Apostle Paul talks about this extensively in Romans and 1 Corinthians as it relates to to, to the things that have little to no moral or uh, uh, to little to no uh, moral bearing. At one time specifically, he teaches that there's nothing wrong to to eat meat that's been offered to idols in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, something that a ton of people had a huge problem with back in that time. But, but, But then he rebuts his own statement by saying, but if a person has loved ones who think that that's wrong, then it'd be better to simply uh, abstain from partaking. Otherwise, uh, that person's loved ones may uh, uh, be stumbling into sin, right? And and it's those types of things where we look and we say uh, either amen or ouch, right? What what are the things that we must abstain from even though we are free to do said things? Now, truth be told, we've already seen that Jesus was never afraid to offend for the Lord's sake. Again, remember a couple of weeks ago when Jesus was throwing down with the Pharisees, calling them hypocrites and brood of vipers, saying you're teaching as doctrine the commandments of men while you're ignoring the commandments of God by not taking care of the people who you need to be taken care of, right? Another sermon that I preached a while ago. I think I get all the fun sermons. I think that's what it is. They're like, Pastor Will, we're just going to throw this fun passage at you, how, nevertheless, the, the matters of the temple, though, Jesus is like, no big deal. There, there's no value here, necessarily, on standing one's ground. In fact, the opposite might be true. Standing one's ground, in this case, might be counterproductive to one's mission. The, the surrendering of one's rights, or dare I say, one's freedom, would actually keep another from stumbling. And then we get this unique conclusion in verse 27. Jesus says, go to the sea and throw in a hook. And take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. And take that and give it to them for you and me. Jesus, again, uses Peter's fishing experience here to perform this miracle. But he doesn't have him fish with a net, as we've seen previously. He takes one line, one hook, to catch a single fish. 
And I like that Jesus uses Peter with something that he's familiar with to kind of give him some confidence, right? And yet he does it in a way that will clearly show that this is all God's work. It is all God's doing. In other words, uh, just make yourself available to be used, and God will do the rest. Yeah, that's a word for somebody this morning. Okay, here you go. So, so he's not going to look for like fish that have money in their mouths. He's called to take the first fish that comes up because it's going to have exactly what he and Peter need to pay the tax, a shekel worth four drachmae. So instead of the half that Peter needs, he says, here's four for the both of us. And, and there's, there's a lot that we could say about this miracle, but the short and sweet is just that this is one more sign that God was at, every, at work in every detail of the mess, Jesus' messianic ministry here on the earth. This providential evidence that shows that Jesus Christ is king and reigns supreme over everything. So how do we land the plane? Well, Thinking about the latter portion of this morning's text, and again, remembering that it's not really about paying taxes to a civil authority, right? Regardless of how corrupt you feel they may be. Matthew 22, 21, pay your taxes, okay? This is not what that message is about. This message is about, yeah? The application for the message is about us truly fulfilling our worship obligation to the Lord. So if at our core, we truly enjoy a relationship with God that frees us from obligations that are imposed on us by others, then as long as those obligations are not directly opposed to God's word or his will, then our observing those things not only shouldn't impact our worshipful hearts, but furthermore, and don't miss this, they can actually make room for the gospel. I already mentioned, but, but I'll say it again, Paul taught and lived this principle. We see him teach it in Romans 14, 20 and 21. He says, do not forsake, or for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. For everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. And he also teaches or lives this principle himself in Acts 16, 26. We see the Bible says, then Paul took the men... And the next day, he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. What this was was a, a, a few, there were a few ritual uh, requirements that, the, uh, that was um, put on by the Old Testament or that we see in the Old Testament that Paul chose to observe to simply remove any potential stumbling blocks that could otherwise get in the way of his ministry to the Jews. And, and, and what we're talking about here this morning is the potential stumbling blocks that may need to be removed for the gospel's sake. Are, are we concentrated on doing whatever we can to make room for the sake of the gospel. Paul goes far in 1 Corinthians uh, 9 and 19. i got to move here. He, he says, For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not my, being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To, the, to those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Why do I do it? I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them and its blessings. Paul was willing to become all things for all people. Why? For the gospel's sake. So, 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 so some might be saved. So the question is, what are we willing to do? What are we willing to become? What obstacles are we removing for the gospel's sake? People that we are loving on for the gospel's sake, those who we are forgiving for the gospel's sake, what freedoms might we limit ourselves to for the gospel's sake? The inverse question must also be asked as well. Is there anything that we are currently observing that is uh, uh, offending another or causing them to stumble, to sin, and turn away from God? You know, I learned a new word in my study. The word is uh, adiaphorous. It just means indifferent or, or neither good nor bad. So the, the, the question is, are there any uh, adiaphorous things, any things that have no inherent moral bearing whatsoever uh, other than the things that I ascribe to it? And that's a whole other can of worms, right? But, but is there anything that is like that, any of those types of matters that have become an obstacle, a stumbling block, a hindrance to the gospel moving forward? Now, trust me, there is a line in which we do not cross 
I don't think that, that we should be so flexible that we're pushed to cowardly compromise. No, 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 no. I, 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 but I do, I believe that there is a concession, right, that is expected, dare I say, commanded by Jesus that is neither spineless nor unevangelical. But I, I think that, that, that such an arrangement is only made possible when we keep the essentials as our focus. And I pray that that is what we would like to do this morning. Let us pray. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for uh, your word, the unfolding of it, which always brings light. Uh, we pray, Lord, that, that as we wrestle with this idea and understanding of, of removing obstacles for the gospel's sake, that you would help us differentiate between the things that are uh, meaningless and the essentials that we need to stand on. We're so grateful that Jesus was delivered for the gospel's sake, and by his example, we are praying that we would be able to remove obstacles from our lives for the sake of the gospel moving forward to others. We thank you so much again for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think that it's such a wonderful, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to respond to the word of God with remembering the Lord's table. And as I mentioned of Jesus in, in uh, what he was prior to him coming to the earth, chose to willingly lay down not only his life, but his glory. And there's a passage in John 17 in Jesus' high priestly prayer when the Bible says, Jesus had spoken these words. He lifted his eyes up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. I glorified you on this earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And, and when we come to this table, we, we, we celebrate the glory of the Lord uh, being restored to our Lord and Savior with the resurrection of his life. We, we celebrate the king's coronation and him rightfully being crowned and seated at the right hand of the Father with all authority on heaven and earth given into his hands. We remember exactly who our Lord and Savior is every time we come to this table and how much honor and glory he willingly deserves. And as we do that, we, we do it with, with, with hearts that are so bent on making sure that we do it for all of the right reasons, right? right? Paul tells us in, in uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, 27, whoever eats therefore the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. And that's not to scare us away from the table, it's to remind us that this ordinance that we do, we do it regularly, sure. But, but, but this is not some rote, routine, mundane, trivial thing that doesn't mean anything. We are supposed to approach this table with reverence, with respect, with remembering that God laid aside his glory for us. Paul continues in verse 28. He says, let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Beloved, it's time for us to just take a moment of self-reflection, of, of, of examination, to understand exactly who you know Jesus to be for yourself and celebrate this ordinance together. So I'd like to invite the men to come forward as we take a moment and just ponder examine, reflect on what Jesus did for us. Here is love vast as the ocean loving kindness as the flood when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood here is love here is love vast 
as the ocean loving kindness as the flood when the prince of life a ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can see Throughout hell's eternal day On the mount of crucifixion Fountains open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy this opportunity as they remembered the Lord's Supper to remind them that there is one thing that is so pivotal to our understanding of who Jesus was, and it is this great ordinance of remembering that his body was broken for us. Paul says to the church, he says, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In that same spirit of self-reflection and examination, we're going to now pass out the cups.
25. He says, in the same way he, he being Jesus, took the cup, saying, this is my blood. This cup is the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us proclaim together. And it is uh, a privilege to uh, and respond to the Lord's, uh, our observance of this ordinance with a global missions offering. This is our time to recognize that as we're here, we're celebrating everything that this table represents, that there's still those who don't know about the atonement, don't know about the propitiation, don't know about the freedom that is found in Jesus' name. And so we take this offering once a month for the support of both our local and global missions partners. So as you prepare your hearts to give, I'm going to pray for us once more. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity and reminder, God, of exactly what you have done for us and your challenge and call for us to go into all the world to share the good news. And we do that through prayer. We do that with our talents. We do that with our time. We do that with our treasure. And so now we pray that you would use this offering, receive it um, as we give cheerfully for the furtherment of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Cántale Juan grande es Dios y todos lo verán. Juan grande es Dios. I uh, love, love, love that song. So much so that I've tried to learn it in Spanish. Not as good, but the verse I got. Just, it's just such a beautiful morning, you know? Just concluding our time of, of worship together with just recognizing, celebrating the Lord's table, recognizing his, his splendor and his majesty, recognizing what he's done for us, recognizing what he's calling us to do. It's just, again, a beautiful morning. And I, I, I want to mention, not we can't forget, the uh, we've got a, a business meeting right after this, and so uh, we got to get going. Uh, but if you're here and you're a member and would love to um, be a part of that, I pray and encourage you to stay. And if you're not, then I pray and encourage you to hang out and see what it's all about. But if you're here, I just want to remind you that the prayer table is available. Whether you're here and you want to know more about who Jesus is, you're interested in church membership, you need prayer regarding removing obstacles for the sake of the gospel in your life, you're not sure what God wants you to do for the sake of the gospel, we would love love, love to pray for you. But I'm going to wrap with the uh, doxology that we get from Jude. The Bible says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. All God's people said amen. amen. God bless you, family.